Are we waiting on anybody else? Um, I think we're good. Okay, well, uh, without further ado, um, I call to order the uh, Ways and Means Committee meeting. Roll call, please. Uh, Chairwoman Sims. Here. Alderman Gould. Here. Alderman Shelton. Here. Alderman Tice. Here. All members are present. Great, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Or are there any amendments or uh, issues anyone cares to raise about what's on the agenda? All right, seeing none, any objection to approve with, by acclamation? Be so approved. All right, um, item three, reports of committee chair and aldermen. Um, I have no report other than uh, to thank everyone um, being here virtually. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we were able to set this up. There are some items on on the agenda that we wanted to take up uh, that could be considered uh, from Monday's meeting. So um, thank you for appearing virtually. Um, Alderman Gould. No report. Alderman Shelton. No report. Alderman Parker Tice. No report. Okay, there's nothing on the city administrator's report. Item four, uh, item five is department uh, reports, 5A planning and development, uh, business license renewal fees. Who's helping us? with that. Whitney Kelly. Good evening. Um, business licenses are valid for one year and end at the December 31st. The code provides that by January 15th, everyone is to renew their license. Um, so we are going through those um, as we speak. And we've noticed that a few licenses had been incorrectly categorized. So we've asked those businesses to reapply and apply under the correct category. And this has, and sometimes increased their fees. And in one case has actually decreased their fee. Um, but we've also found out that several businesses had not been reporting on all of their properties within the city of Brentwood. Um, some have not paid business license since 2018 and the code says that when they're delinquent there's a 10% penalty. So I wanted to ask your guidance on I've asked that they reapply and reestablish for the 2022 but do we uh, want to apply the 10% penalty um, and then have them reestablish for the prior years to get them back in line or do we want to start from just now and pay the 10% penalty and, and that's it. Um, there were a number of businesses that have contacted us, contacted us that said, oh, well, it looks like we forgot to pay since 2018. Um, so I'm just asking how you feel we should reapply. Also, there was a num another business, Millman Lumber, that is located on 5.99 acres. They were paying $50 business license fee for 500 square feet. So I have sent them, um, asked them to reapply under the correct category as a merchant for gross receipts. They have not responded at this time. I'm following up with the letter, but they may contact y'all as well. Um, so I wanted to give you a heads up on that. Um, so I guess the first the first question, it seems like a lot. The first question is the businesses that are delinquent and are looking to reestablish themselves. The code says that there's a 10% um, delinquent fee. Um, so the, the request or the question being asked is, would you like us to start anew instead of imposing that 10% fee, delinquent fee, because it goes back multiple years and it could possibly be expensive depending on the classification for that type of business. What What's the level of magnitude? I, I'm not, not having applied for a business license in Frontwood, although I'm sure my firm has one. Um, what are we talking about annually? I mean, and are we talking about people who are just willfully not paying or are we talking about people who tried and maybe unbeknownst you know they fall into both categories that you just mentioned yeah. 
Yeah, it does fall into both categories. Um, and not to throw anyone out, but Met Meridian Medical has about seven properties in the city of Brentwood. They'd only been paying their business license on two of those. Um, the other five um, hadn't had a business license since 2018, as far as we can tell. Um, so, so those fees are like $1,000 for one property. It depends on um, how they, the square footage of each property or the building with within which they're operating. Um, one business was paying as an office use and was paying $1,140. Um, however, they really should have been a gross receipts. And so their bill went up to $6,000, $6,027. Uh, so it, it just runs the gamut. It's just based upon gross receipts is one, Point two five one dollar and twenty five cents for every thousand dollars of gross revenue. Um, exception business such as offices is ten square feet, or ten cents per square foot of the business. So, like Millman Lumber indicated on their business license that they were fifty square feet, but they have five point nine acres. <laughs> so, and they listed their business type as a merchant. So therefore we said, you need to reapply as a merchant. I don't know the total impact of that on their business yet. They haven't reapplied or indicated gross receipt uh, revenue yet. So some of them, it might be easy for us to do a calculation, but those who are submitting gross receipts for the first time, um, we have no way to really determine what that number could be. Right. Well, I mean, at for my first reaction is, I mean, it seems like we ought to apply the code and if there's, a reason to make an exception or if the code allows for one. I mean, you know, if, if for example, someone applied and they selected a form of classification that we didn't correct for several years, I, I don't know if we can necessarily, I mean, I, I guess I kind of want to, you know, apply the law evenly and, and, and if it's appropriate to make an accommodation or if someone raises an objection you know, it seems like we ought to deal with it that way. I mean, that's my gut reaction, but certainly, you know, if a committee's got... If I may also interject, if you remember, there was a particular case last year where that business owner um, really challenged the city hard regarding the delinquent fee, and we made that business, the city made that business pay up. So um, just to, to remind you of that, um, that maybe we need to be consistent in its application. I, mean, I would also, yeah, for those that may have, that have been paying and, and maybe just applied it under the incorrect business license and we didn't catch it, I'm not sure I would apply the delinquency there, but those that have not applied or have not had a business license for several years, that's when I would uh, apply the delinquent fee is but I wanted to get your direction on that. So. Alderman Shelton. Yeah, no, I agree with what Alderman Sim said. And it sounds like Whitney's saying the same thing is, you know, the ones that were in our air, the ones that we can go back and say, you know, we didn't catch that it was um, not classified correct, um, should be the ones that maybe we have some leniency on, but following the code and applying that going forward. My question is like, what is the process? Are we, set up to correct this going forward that we do catch this or review this, or is it just kind of trying to educate and make sure that these are done correctly by the business or um, how do we prevent it going forward? Um, that's what we're working on. Um, I mean, we've caught it because, you know, maybe it's just fresh eyes and, and really looking at the applications more in detail. I can't say we've caught all of them. Um, so we would just continue to do so as the years progress or move forward. Um, and then we'll be start working on how to capture those businesses that haven't applied um, after the January 15th deadline um, through, the, through the summer and all of that, so. Uh, Alderman Gould. Yeah, so, um... I'm assuming you know we're, our goal is to try to collect as many of the unpaid 
for however many years they've needed to be paying that that they they should be paying get, making them whole and then moving forward let's just try to get on on track I, I guess the question is regarding the the 10 percent how's the code written is it is it a compounding 10 percent every time you're you, you're not paid up or is it one one 10 percent penalty um and then you get sort of paid up and then um moving forward to try to get on keep on track it doesn't really clarify it doesn't really state that any either of those it just says there's a 10 percent delinquent charge um to be entered for all unknown known unpaid occupational tax bills so that's the other question I was seeking your guidance on is do we want to go have them reestablished for prior years and pay a 10% fee or as long as we get them now and pay the one time 10% fee then we have them move forward I mean I'd say if the if the if it's not code's not clearly written there then I you know um, then it seems like a one one 10% penalty on wh however much you still the back that you back owe, as opposed to, you know, a ten percent for this year, ten percent for that last year, however many years you, you know, hadn't been paying your license. Um, that that just seems like a, a detail that should be written in there so that there's some clarity and, and it's not a judgment call. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would start with like fair is fair and the law is the law. Like apply it. I. Am I missing something? I mean, I. Right. Alderman Shelton. So for these businesses that have been paid going back multiple years, are they notified each year and then they just neglect to do it? Or is it just something that they're supposed to know to do every year? It was, it's something they're supposed to know to do every year through my gov. It does send out a renewal notice at the end of the year. Um, and their business license does say that they're only valid till December 31st, so they have to renew. Um, so we've, we've been in that process now. With Meridian Medical, they contacted us saying, hey, we tried to renew, but we found these two applications, but the remaining five properties we can't find in the system. What do we do now? <laughs> and then another one is we've gotten a phone call from someone saying, hey, I realized I apparently didn't pay a business license, but I've been here for 20 years. <laughs> uh, so right now they've contacted us for the most part. The others we've caught as we're reviewing the applications, if they've been in mis incorrectly um, putting it uh, ca categorized. Um, and then we, we would work on how to identify those that did not renew um, and those that might be in the city that never received a business license. So. All the women ties. So are there businesses that, are you just looking back three years or are there people that could be 20 years back? I mean, part of, I, I think we, people need to pay what they owe, but there's also sort of a, if the city hasn't looked at this for and figured it out for 20 years, then I, I think it's sort of unreasonable for us to then go back and demand this when we just now caught it. So I don't know if we, we if there's a, we could look back if we're looking back three years and fixing from there forward and imposing the penalties. But I also think there's some sort of a, you know, even when you're audited, yeah. you, the IRS can only go back so far. I right think now, there are accounts that we know that for whatever reason, I, I don't want to be mentioning names of businesses that we know have deliberately chosen not to renew and they continue to operate. And when they've come before P and Z for, um, for X or for Y, I, I think that's the best example. Um, we've notified them, we've notified their architects or their engineers, and then we've notified that business and they have still chosen not to renew. So I, I would say previous staff in the planning development department have known about that and have been working on it without success. Okay, so it's not that they're unknown, it's that the businesses yeah. have chosen. Right. Well, that's so what's a totally the, situation. What, what's the Thank result you. of willful uh, failure to pay a business license fee? I mean, are they, 
is it like ultimately a civil matter or, you know, like MSD, they take you to court for not paying your sewer bill? I mean, is that what happens or what? Um, they could lose their license if they don't have it. We haven't gone to the extent of placking the business and saying, you know, you're closed. That, that would be extreme. Um, so we haven't done that. And obviously going to, going to court might be an option. I'd like to rely on Mr. O'Keefe for direction on that. Um, but yeah. Could you, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna put a lawyer hat on and speak out of turn, but I mean, it would seem to me if something ha has not gone, if we haven't made a demand or otherwise enforced something in 20 years have gone by, it seemed to me the statute of limitations might weigh in and you, you're cut off at five years. I mean, that's, I mean, maybe that's, do you think uh, that Kevin could yes. provide some clarity on that? We've been, Whitney's been talking to Kevin about this. Did you ask Kevin, do, do we have an opinion, Whitney? No, um, I haven't gone back. I've discussed prior years. Um, my gov is only, has business license from 2018. So we've only been following up, looking at the, all of the business license since 2018 in our current system. Um, and then one of the, the tasks I was looking at doing for our assistant was to contact property owners and say, who's all in your, who's all operating and give us a copy of their business license or if they don't have one, they need to apply for one. Um, I mean, People can move into an office and set up shop and we may, if they don't call for a business license or they don't get the inspection or if the property manager doesn't require that from them, you know, they could move in and we wouldn't know it. Um, so it's one of the things that I will, we would be working on um, this, in the next, in the coming months. I mean, I, my thought is, and I'm certainly wouldn't, you know, however the committee feels, if you're looking for direction, my thought is, you know, apply the law as written. You know, if they haven't paid, they, they should. And, you know, look at the strays and outliers and unique situations as, as they come about. That sound good? Yeah. Yes, thank you. We'll, you we'll be bring you back. <laughs> I mean, well, you're saying that. Does the committee agree? Yeah, does that sound okay? <laughs> I'm seeing I'm thumbs up in agreement on that issue. Um, okay. So we'll bring back more updates as uh, work progresses. Thank you, Whitney. <laughs> okay, uh, so we'll move on. Um, next item: uh, Department Report Five B is the financial statement fiscal year 2021. Uh, who's who's helping us with that one? Robin Jones. Robin, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I apologize. Good evening, I'm just talking. <laughs> um, so we've issued a preliminary report for uh, fiscal year ending December 31st, 2021. And just to give you a little background on why the report is preliminary at this time, it is early in the year and we are still receiving and processing 2021 invoices. And we are also uh, making sure that we have accounted for all revenues received during the year. Uh, and the, the best way that we do that is by making sure that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have reconciled all of our bank accounts thoroughly to account for that. So I have uh, done an analysis, pretty high level of where we stand as of now for revenues for the fiscal year end. And um, given some explanations in the report uh, for the variances, this report is actual versus budget. So to start with general revenues, overall, we, outper we outperformed the budget. Uh, we budgeted at 12.4 million, revenues came in at 14.1 million. Capital Improvement Fund revenues uh, budget was 3.3 million and we came in at 3.1. The difference in that 
had to do with, uh, we expected some revenue from the Rosalie Avenue STP that we did not receive during the year. And our annual investment returns were down in 2021. For the Economic Development Fund, we budgeted 3.2 million. We received 3.6 million. Um, the revenues for the economic development sales tax came in higher than what we budgeted. Stormwater and Parks Improvement Fund budgeted 9.7 million. We came in at 7.4 million. The major decrease in overall revenues are attributed to revenues expected from MSD, MSD that were not received in 2021, but we have since received some of those revenues in the month of January. Sewer improvement funds, we budgeted at 147,500 and revenues came in at 154,419. Any questions? I'm gonna pause there. Any questions on the general fund and um, all the revenues that I've gone over. I, I went over everything that's in the budget. Any questions or concerns there? Um, I had a question. As to the um, stormwater, was that just, I mean, did we, have we since gotten the money that it would uh, uh, either, you know, put us on budget or, or exceed the estimated revenues? In the last week, uh, we have gotten close to a million dollars uh in different um in the form of different checks we haven't had a chance to get all of those entered into the system yet um that was our goal this week because we actually got a few checks at the end of last week and early this week but due to the snow we haven't been able to enter anything into the system yet but i think that that will pretty much put us uh even although we can't show those revenues in last year's budget, if that makes sense, because we didn't receive them until this year. Got it. But would you say overall our, our revenues exceeded our budget numbers? Yes, I, I would. I would it's if, they, did, if okay. they didn't overall, we were pretty close because we outperformed the budget in almost every fund. Got it. And it's not as if the stormwater, eventually we are going to get that money we yes. Just happened when it closed. We didn't have a check in hand. Correct. Um, not and, like there's a structural thing that happens, and now we have to realign. No, uh, it was just yes. It, it's just a timing difference. We expected it in 2021, and they didn't start coming in until the middle of January, late January. And most of those are uh, Brentwood bound grant funds okay. from MSD. That all appears to be great news to me. Uh, does the committee have any questions? I'm not seeing any. Alderwoman Tice. I just have a comment on the general revenue and sort of a, a compliment to Bola for the, how she's running things. The on the um, you know we came in so high over budget and we got some unexpected revenues. But even if we hadn't gotten the additional use tax, the ARPA and the CARES revenue, from what I was looking at, we we still spent 340 less than. Um, than um, budgeted. So, uh, you know, just kudos to careful financial management in these uncertain times. Thank you to the department directors as well. Um, only able to do it because of them. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in great shape. So I think that's, you know, thank you to, to, to BOLA, to the department heads, this committee, no, so this this committee too because it's uh, this is a tough committee. I hope you guys know that. <laughs> okay, so <That's> fair. <laughs> um, Some of us are tougher than others, probably. <laughs> right. You know, we also have department directors. Um, I think I checked, and there's like 28, 20 people in attendance at this meeting tonight. So um, I guess maybe the next presentation for Robin is operating expenditures. And so if you all have, you know, if you have questions, department directors are also here to answer your questions. Robin. Okay. So um, department expenditures. Um, first I did a, I performed an analysis uh, just for the general fund 
And we have two departments that overspent, um, but these will be taken care of as part of the budget amendment. So the expenses um, were higher than budgeted in administration due to miscellaneous contractual expenses for consultants. Um, that line item, that's the reason for that um, overspending, but it's uh, specifically in one line item, if that makes sense. Um, for municipal operating expenses, uh, the expense for the IT contract with the city of Clayton was underfunded and it looks like it has been historically underfunded. So we will be working to move that expense, uh, move the budget and the expense in alignment with each other so that we can avoid that. Um, all other departments overall their actual expenses were less than budgeted. So that brings us to the total general fund budget uh, being uh, where we spent under what was budgeted overall. So are there any questions about the general fund expenses? Are we in a position now going forward to kind of course correct in terms of uh, the miscellaneous contractual expenses to you know accurately budget what we're going to be spending? Yes, um, there will be some more discussion as we go on in the next few months about some um, creative and uh, meaningful ways to reduce expenses in that category. Does the committee have any, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, so I guess you don't have any questions. Okay, and for the capital improvement fund expenditures were under uh, the actual, were under what was budgeted. We, we uh, budgeted 3 million, we uh, expended 2.1 million. Economic development fund, uh, we budgeted 2.5573, slightly over with 2.577. Stormwater and Parks Improvement Fund budgeted was 37.9 million. Uh, actual expenses were 2.5. And the Sewer Improvement Fund was 159,700 and expenses were $106,408. Any questions about any of those? Thank you. All right, seeing any questions? Um, I guess, are we ready to move on? I mean, I, other than numbers look good, so please about that. Um, uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, fiscal year 2021 budget amendment update. Robin? I'm sorry. So at the end of, well, mid-January, I shared with Bola um, once we started discussing where we were with the 2021 budget amendment. And so, as I understand it, we need, we the city performs budget amendments to carry over any budget amounts from 2020 that were not spent until 2021. And then we should also include any budget changes for 2021, such as unanticipated overages, new budget items approved by the Board of Aldermen during the budget year, et cetera. So once I entered, once I issued the preliminary 2021 year-end financial statement, based upon that analysis and some operating trends and historical data, because we're still receiving 2021 invoices, it would be premature at this point to amend the 2021 budget. 
We want to make sure that we are, that we uh, have paid a, paid and posted, received, paid and posted all of the 2021 invoices, and then reevaluate mid February, so that we can do some additional analysis and gauge whether uh, or not we should expect any more 2021 invoices. Also verify that we accounted for all of the 2021 revenues. Kind of a recap of what I just talked about, why that financial statement is preliminary. Um, so that is where we are now, but, I, but what's really important is going back to what I believe is a best practice. Uh, Gina Jarvis and I work very closely together and the information from her is that prior to 2016, budget tracking was done on a monthly basis and the budget amendment was done in mid-December of the fiscal year versus what has become a March tradition the following year. So we would like to return back to that best practice where we um, are evaluating monthly and tracking our expenses so that we can do the budget uh, amendment in mid-December of this year instead of the March timeline that's in place. Are there any questions or concerns or any additional information that's needed? Um, I'm, I just want to make sure I understand. I mean, so you're, you're proposing, and it was something that was done previously, that any kind of budget amendments to, I guess, what, to the budget of 2022 won't occur until December of 2022? Did I? Yes. So that we're not crossing multiple fiscal years. Mm -hmm. And so that Every year, I'm not issuing a preliminary financial statement to you so that it would be more finalized so that we can have a clean cutoff period because the beginning of the year is the busiest time for finance because we have to quickly move into audit season as well. So this will allow, allow us not only to be able to issue finance, uh, finalized financial statements, but also we would be preparing for the audit audit simultaneously because we would need all of this work to be completed before we uh, start our audit. How would we um, address, you know, that the, we would essentially be doing an amendment for a year that's about to end. I mean, in terms of an, I'm just trying to think of an unanticipated substantial expense where there, there needs to be an amendment to the budget. We're doing it I guess at first blush that we're doing it so far after it may have happened. Like what if the occurrence happened in March and now we're approving a budget change not until the following December? How, how would we address that situation? So if there are changes in expenses during this fiscal year, because that's the way Gina and I looked at it. So for the month of Jan January that just passed, we would, we would be tracking and watching each department's expenses carefully and making note of those. And we would do that every single month until we got to the end of November and mid-December where we could make a good guesstimate as to what lines are over or under spending so that we could have, it a, have a budget amendment done completed during that same year versus waiting the following year and three months later to amend. The, to the amend differences the in operational procedures, internal operational procedures. Right. That's, that's what Robin's explaining. The board would never see that. Um, and so what has been happening is that we haven't been tracking it and then we would just wait until the year end and then use January, February to track it and make those adjustments and bring it to the, to the board's attention. So what she's saying is now we're going to be tracking it every month so that by December we were current and we can bring those changes to you. By the end of the year, we should know what all those changes are going to be. And so we can bring it to you. So it's just an internal operational procedure that's changing in finance compared to how it's been done since 2016. I think that's what Robin's trying to explain. 
Yes, I probably didn't do a good job at it. Thank you, Bola. <laughs> The That's irony, my irony is that I'm not really a numbers person, so, <laughs> and I have no well, problem admitting yeah. what weakness. So I right. want to make sure yes. if I understand right. it, everyone can understand it. All um, right, all romanticize. So just to, so I understand, I, like it just seems to make sense that we're going to make this change and it's going to be going forward. So, um, but there might be some things at the end of the year that would come in and it just is going to go in the next. It would, or would, would you catch it by December? Like if we approve a budget amendment in the middle of December and then, you know, I don't know, the, the stormwater stuff, like, the, like it may be the stormwater is an example. Like you said, all, not all the stormwater revenue was in, so it didn't come in in 2021. So does that show up in 2022? Or are there other examples like that that just would show up in the following year? And so numbers would be a little off on that current budget year? Yes, but it wouldn't be to the degree and extent where we're doing it for a full 12 months, right. because that's what we're doing right now. We're doing a budget amendment for the full 12 months and trying to gather everything all at once versus a monthly tracking system so that we could bring it to you right away in a relevant fashion. Okay, great. That sounds like a great change. Yeah, and I guess I suppose if something really pops, like you will we you you'll be in a position to bring that to our attention uh as you're tracking it yes absolutely absolutely to uh account for any um emergencies or um extraordinary things that happen like the pandemic and things like that so just a better tracking system internally um well, I think that sounds like a good idea. Do you do you need us to vote on that? Is that or is that just this is information? Information. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not seeing any other questions, but I think that makes sense. Um, I'm seeing nods of agreement um, in my Brady Bunch screen. Uh, all right. So, are, are, is there anything else on that topic? No. I don't have it. Oh, I don't have anything. Thank no. you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Has everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes that were posted? Any changes, observations? I'm not seeing anyone raising their hands. Any objection approving the minutes by acclamation? All right, seeing none, they'll be approved. Um, moving on to item seven, new business. 7A is the discussion of reinstating the pandemic lead. Uh, Jason, are you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, basically, uh, what I just wanted to kind of throw out there, there had been some concern from uh, various departments, uh, primarily police, fire, and public works. Uh, as with the Omicron variant that's come out, we've had a significant number of our employees test positive. And as such, even with the reduced um, time to quarantine or to be away per the CDC guidelines, this is causing a significant number of our employees uh, to be out for uh, five days on up. Uh, we've experienced this now in every single department. Um, now, while we do have a very robust sick leave policy, this is also impacting some of our new employees. Uh, it, to be honest, both of our brand new firefighters uh, have not even had the opportunity to work long enough to have enough time on the books to cover this amount of leave that's required of them by the CDC. Uh, we've had other employees uh, in administration that um, one had experienced a rather significant injury uh, last year, burned through a significant amount of her sick leave, and due to being testing positive for COVID, uh, she was unable to return. And we're starting to see more and more of our people uh, be affected by this. What the, the prospect of this is, is not adding a bank to any given employee, it's coding the first 80 hours uh, or the appropriate amount for whichever department as COVID leave in a given calendar year. So I don't want there to be anyone, uh, any misconception that I'm asking to add leave to anyone's existing bank. We're asking to put time aside before they actually hit said bank and just reset it each year, provided that it is for a pandemic related response. Um, now I know Bola had sent out a, um, uh, a survey to some of our comparator municipalities and that was also attached here. One thing I do wanna point out, the board had considered this prior to 
the onset or early on in the onset of the pandemic, and we chose to suspend it at that point because the federal government came out with the FFCRA or the Families First uh, Coronavirus Relief Act, which basically mandated uh, an additional 80 hours of sick leave for uh, pandemic related leaves or pandemic related illnesses. Uh, and that kind of superseded the need for us to implement anything like that on our own. So what I'm asking here is for the committee to consider uh, allowing this addition to the employee pop or the employee handbook. Um, I'm not looking at putting this back into place back into 2021, just simply retroing it back to the beginning of 2022. Those individuals that had used their sick leave, if this were to be implemented, we would just simply go back and credit their sick leave balance, the amount of time that they took for COVID um, and then going forward, all of our COVID related illnesses would be able to be coded in the system as COVID sick. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding it. So if I am, if I'm sick with COVID and I don't go to work, am I using my sick leave or do I get the special COVID sick leave? Currently, there are our employees are using their sick leave or whatever PTO they have available. As I kind of indicated, we, we've had several of our new employees that are not yet eligible for sick leave to even use it or that don't have enough sick leave to cover that amount of time uh, having to be off for five days. Right. Now, my, my question is, if this under this policy, are they getting like 80 hours of COVID sick leave? Is that what or it, however, whatever the time is? Yes, it would be the, the sick leave that they would have otherwise been using will be coded as COVID sick. And that would be then on top of whatever sick leave that accrues already. Yes, ma'am. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Correct. I wanted to... But it, it's then, not added to their bank. I just want to make sure that, that um, we're not... Um, this would only be applicable for individuals that have this particular illness. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we add an 80 hour uh, additional amount to every single employee's bank. It's only in the event that they are out with um, pandemic related illness that we then code their illness as COVID sick until they hit that cap of 80 hours. Right. So it, it's the most likely reason of being out sick at the moment though, I'd say. So they get, I don't, they don't, uh, employee doesn't have any accrued sick time. They have COVID, they're out, they get 80 hours. That's not that they don't have to necessarily accrue. And then yes. if they come back and they break an ankle or whatever. Then they would use their sick leave. They're, they're regular. Um, okay, I just wanted to make sure I, but we're kind yes, of siloing out 80 hours for COVID. Correct. Uh, that, that, that someone gets who's either a new or existing employee regardless of how long they've been there. But if it's COVID yes, related, boom. Um, okay, I just, I just wanted to make sure I understood it. Um, but I did see some hands. Alderman Gould. Yeah, and, and what's the, if, is the 80 hour, was the 80 hours established originally because it was based on the two weeks uh, needing to be out? It was. It was. I so mean, it, again, it's been reduced to it, does it need to be 80 hours still? Or, that's or are that's we, for the committee to decide. Or, or is it, you know, the potential of, of reinfection, um, which seems to be happening with people too? Um, um, so I guess the, I guess that's a question that I have is why wouldn't it be if if it's reduced now to five days, um, you know why wouldn't it be forty hours of of potential um, instead of eighty? Just curious. That's an option. Absolutely. Alderman Shelton. Would there be any sort of requirement of a positive test or is this eligible for, you know, I was exposed to someone. I know that's a kind of an ever-changing guidance of whether or not you're supposed to quarantine or not, but um, can you touch on that on kind of how you would go about that? Uh, absolutely. Um, up till now, we have been able to, to test in-house when we have someone that is either unvaccinated, they're required to test on a weekly basis, or if they're symptomatic, uh, we are able to test over at the fire department and they are able to get that result back within a 24 hour, or excuse me, within a 15 minute span. Uh, and then if we have a positive test, invariably they do test a second time just to validate that test, make sure there wasn't an issue with it. 
Um, the way things work currently, if an employee is out for greater than three days at a given time for uh, any related illness, we do require a doctor's notification for that. So I, I would think that in order for an employee to qualify for this, they would need to present uh, a positive test. Now, whether that's a test from the fire department or if they choose to go and get uh, an a test outside. Um, but again, currently we are allowing tests internally. And for all those employees that, this, that have currently tested positive, the fire department has been sharing that information with myself and the supervisor, and then the positive test results are going in their, their medical file. So as an example, I already have that data for the individuals that have been out, but have been using their own personal leave thus far because they're out for greater than three days already. If you so, look at the example, I mean, the survey, particularly city of grief core, um, so that aligns with what Alderman Gould just said, that because of the new CDC guidelines, they were giving 40, so 40 hours of pandemic leave. Um, but it's it's all over the place. Not everybody's offering it, but theirs stand out because it's 40. So I just wanted to um, bring your attention to that survey result. Are we differentiating in any way for people who aren't vaccinated and therefore far more likely to get COVID? No, ma'am. Only a positive test. Um, well, does anyone, I mean, what are your thoughts, committee? 40 hours, 80 hours? I mean, I, Alderwoman Tice? Well, I would, but it looks like both Creve Corps and Maplewood have either 40 hours or five days. It just depends on the, um, how they reported it. Um, I mean, then I guess I sort of think that's reasonable because that's the um, that's the new CDC guideline, and um, I like the stipulation that if you're out more than three days, you have to have a um, some sort of proof of a test. Um, I would be in agreement with something like that. Yeah, and I'm not sure whether I. I mean, I think if we didn't have a COVID mandate already, I would definitely think we should tie this to COVID vaccination because it might be a nice carrot, but I don't know what I think about sort of neutral on your question, Sonny, just now about whether the people, like this only counts, as, you only get the leave if you're vaccinated. I'm not sure what I think about that. Well, I mean, I wasn't, it, I'm asking the question. I'm not saying I'm going to propose an amendment. I just put an emphasis on it. Um, but I mean, I'm inclined to think that, I mean, as someone who had the Omicron uh, virus, um, I mean, I, I wasn't, five days, was, I mean, I was fine after five days. I mean, I'm, in, I'm inclined to think 40 hours and proof of either a test or exposure uh, after the third day, um, you know, just so that there's some kind of internal check. I mean, because this is on top of the sick leave that they are they're otherwise accruing. Can I ask another question about this actual 40 hour thing? How did how would that work for like police and fire? Because some of them you might have COVID on a shift. Right. And they're working, you know, they have to be out five days, but that's more than 40 hours. So I, I don't want to penalize um, parts well, of our staff who just work a not a non-traditional nine to five uh, job because that's a lot of our employees. And that's, uh, that's definitely a valid point. Uh, what we would typically do for police, they would remain the same because police typically work 80 hours in a payroll cycle. Uh, so they, the 40 hours would be appropriate for them. For the uh, firefighters, um, initially the thought would have been 96 hours. If we have that, then it would be 48, which would be one cycle. Um, a lot of it depends on how their, their cycles fall and when an employee would potentially test positive. I'm thinking prim primarily for firefighters um, because they work a 4896. So if an employee were to test positive, as an example, in the middle of a 48, that five days would carry them into um, a one day uh, and then the two subsequent um, shift days for a, a rotation, which would actually be 72 hours. So it, it, I, I think the 48 is, it would be a, a, a valid 
a compromise, but um, there had already been a proposal to, uh, to, to have a differing amount. We also have like our, our sanitation workers, they are typically scheduled for a six and a half hour day. Um, so therefore they would not get the, um, the 40 hours, it would be their 32. Uh, 32 and a half, I believe. Uh, likewise, we've got a, a court staff member that's 37 and a half. So again, it, the thought would be to, to cover five, the equivalency of five days or five shift days. Uh, fire is the only one that really poses a true um, issue with regards to that calculation. So would that be, I mean, I understand that 40 hours is meant to approach five days so for fire would it be six days um it would probably i think the the it would either be 48 or 72 um 72 would be three shift days uh 48 being two shift days and how is that going to be adjusted or reflected in the what i think it was an 80 hour proposal for firemen was that going to be it, it, it they, they would have been um the proposal there would have been 96 for the for the firefighters. Okay, so we're still on the same kind of ratio. Yes, ma'am. If we just did, if, when I'm thinking as a euphemism, the 40 hour version. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Alderman Gould. Uh, does what is this? If if they themselves did not um, get COVID, but their spouse um, does, and and they have to stay home because of quarantining or anything like that, um, you know, um, how does that cover it? If they, don't, if they don't have to, if they have to produce a positive test, I guess. We, we, we could potentially request um, the, a copy of the, the positive test for the family member just with the, uh, the privacy information blacked out. We already uh, have most of the um, employees spousal or children information on file if they're on our benefits plan anyway. So it's not like the employee's divulging something that they, they wouldn't have ordinarily. Got it, okay. Um, I think our chiefs have their hands up. I, if you are Chief Spies or Chief Control, if you wanna, whoever speaks first gets to go. <laughs> Chief Spies, you're, you're unmuted. Can you hear me, Chairwoman? This is Ronnie. Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for the conversation. I just wanted to address a couple questions that were asked. Um, Alderman Gould asked about uh, exposures. So the guidelines with vaccinated uh, individuals, which uh, all of our employees are, uh, except for just a few with exemptions, they are still allowed to work while wearing a mask. So an exposure to a family member, a child, a child's friend, we've encountered this throughout. It, it's no longer treated as they need to stay home. Um, as long as they're negative, as long as they are without symptoms, they have to wear their mask, um, they can continue to work. Um, and back to, uh, Jason explained it well. We have uh, St. Louis County, um, emergency safety plan that we are currently still operating under, firefighters are still in a seven day quarantine period. We cannot go to the five day quarantine by CDC because of our jobs and living together, commingling inside the station. Um, they, and it's a countywide plan currently. Um, and we've operated by that. Um, so our, we do have people that have been affected by the 72 hours of sick leave use um, during this Omicron variant. So I, I just wanted to share that information. Thank you. Um, I guess it I don't know happen. what happened to Chief Speece. He's not there right now, so I don't know what. So it just, Ronnie, just so I understand if you, I guess if someone has it and they're symptomatic, um, they've got a, a fireman's got to be out for seven days. Is that? Yes, that is correct. And most of our people have used 48 hours of sick leave during their seven 
days, but no, well, I would say half have stretched it to uh, the 72 hours, close to half. We, we've just had to put them on that, that third day off. I, I guess I'm inclined to think that unless there's some kind of superseding requirement of being out, you know, or the someone doesn't have a choice of, and the fireman being an example of that, um, that it was, I, I mean, I'm inclined to think the 40 hours would be sufficient over, over the 80. I mean, because this is on top of their sick leave. I mean, I, you know, it's not, it's not like we're you know, and I, I think we're dealing with a different kind of variant. Um, but I am sympathetic that if they, they don't have a choice and they have to be out seven days, that seems like a horse of a different color. Um, are there, what are the thoughts on that? Yeah, I would agree with that. If there's some other, something superseding, I mean, if we're trying to follow COVID guidelines and there's something for certain members of our staff employees who are doing some having to follow some other guidelines that seems um, like they shouldn't be penalized. So um, in terms of direction or resolution or, or I mean, that, that, I mean, I think that's I'm saying 40 hours, it might mean five days, you know, whatever their ratio is, unless there has to be some kind of requirement that more happen. I mean, I think that would be whatever, we, we, whatever matches the CDC guidelines. Yeah. Um, I mean, is there an artful way? We of can start off at 40. If right. there's a need for something more, we'll bring it back. Jason will bring it back. Right. It, it could be written in such a way to provide that exception. Okay. Before, before it comes to the board, we'll have legal take a look. So absolutely, one hundred percent. Have some of the wordsmiths, you know, yeah. <laughs> Alderman Gould. Yeah, I did, just as a question to future proof this, <laughs> as things evolve and change, um, if they change the guidelines, does this? Can we write this in a way that it sort of adjusts as guidelines adjust, or, or is this going to be something that we just have to take up every single time? you know, a new variant or a new new ruling comes up. I think I could write it in such a way that uh, that would qualify that. We could put something to the effect of 40 hours or the CDC guideline, whichever is higher, something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, and then if there were to be a change that would dramatically have a budgetary impact, I would definitely bring it back to ways and means to let you, you be aware of, of the potential downside to something like that. Okay. Do you need anything further from us or is that, is this direction or do you need a resolution? A motion and a vote. <laughs> um, oh, I guess it, uh, entertain a motion to approve the uh, COVID sick leave that's been discussed with the 40 hour time frame or a superseding slash CDC guideline, whichever is higher. Um, so moved. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? I guess Jason, you you know what I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> okay. I will. I will um, do what I can to get this. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't up feel quickly. that artfully. Uh, but you know, I think I, I think the sentiment's been captured. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, so, um, do we need to avoid uh, an individual vote, or can we just do an up down? I think it might be best because this is going to come in the form of an ordinance. To the okay. Board. All right. Uh, and roll call, please. I'm not seeing any uh, any questions or further discussion unless there. So, Alderwoman um, Sims. Yes. Alderman Gould. Yes. Alderman Shelton. Yes. Alderman Tice. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, motion carries. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, all right. The next. Uh, item on um, new business 7b the audit request for a uh, proposal for fiscal year 2021 
Robin's presenting this one as well. Hello again. Um, so I am coming forward with a with the results of the request for proposal for financial auditing services for three years with an option for two one year extensions effective for the 2021 financial audit. The city issued the RFP, <clears throat> excuse me, for financial auditing services on November 15, 2021. Two potential bidders contacted me directly with questions, resulting in publishing an addendum to the RFP on December 8, 2021. So the process is to get those questions and answers uh, published to the city's website. So we, we did that. And that submission deadline for the bids, uh, the proposals, I'm sorry, was 4 p.m. on December 13, 2021. The city received zero proposals by that deadline. So in some discussions with BOLA, I recommended an addendum to the RFP to extend the deadline with the closing date of January 7, 2022 at 4 p.m. Two potential bidders contacted me directly prior to the publication of Addendum 2, um, expressing interest in submitting a bid due to some internal issues that were going on with their firms. And they were advised to see the city's website. Clifton Larson Allen, LLP, also known as CLA, was one of the firms that contacted me on December 20th, um, expressing interest in submitting a bid. And they were the only firm to offer a proposal for the services uh, that met the deadline of January 7th at 4 p.m. The proposal we received was well prepared. Um, and I'm happy to inform the committee that CLA is the eighth largest firm in the country. They have experience in delivering audit and accounting services, as well as other financial services. Um, in our discussions regarding um, present presentation to the committee, the proposal, I have developed a very um, professional and um, supportive relationship with the principal, Andrew Zabel, who is actually in attendance at this meeting. Um, I've checked their references. MSD is a client, the city of Decatur, Illinois is a client, and there are other um, municipalities in the region that use them as well. They are, uh, they have 4,150 governmental clients nationwide, and that includes cities, counties, municipalities, states, state agencies, and school boards. They also perform single audits, which the city will need as a recipient of federal grant awards, uh, including our ARPA funds. Um, CLA stands out based upon several key factors, including the quality of their proposal, governmental experience of the firm, experience of the assigned staff, and the ability to complete the services in a timely manner um, and the total cost are in alignment with the budget. So I would like to recommend um, that CLA be selected for the financial auditing services. Funding is available in the 2022 adopted budget line item 10-105-6165. If there are any questions um, or concerns, are there any questions or concerns, I should say. Alderman Gould. Um, it, yeah, and, is, and this, this may be for BOLA. Um, when we do these RFPs, is there any stipulation that we must get more than one response in order to be able to decide? Or is it as long as it's opened up and then, um, I mean, they, they very well may be the best choice, but it's also our only choice, right? That, that is right. So when we started this process, we 
um, pull together a list of every audit firm that we knew locally. We went as far as Columbia, Springfield, Jeff City, Illinois. So it was a robust list that we sent out and um, despite that got no responses. Um, so we also used the city's treasurer um, to, to help us contact, because you know he's an auditor as well, contact some of the firms he knew to, to gauge interest. So um, ideally we'd liked more than one response, but um, we only got one response. The last time we went out and ended up with uh, Daniel and Jones Associates. We went through a similar process and only ended up with one response. So, but I, I'm comfortable with everything that Robin has said that they, they would be a great firm to, to partner with the city. Okay, as long as it doesn't open us up for liability issues later on or somebody saying, hey, you, you really should have exhausted that search a little bit more. I, I'm trusting that we did exhaust that search by, we, by what we you're did. saying. <laughs> we we so. did and, you know, had people knock on doors to, to try right. to help them, to talk them into submitting or trying to find out what, why, why they were holding off and didn't really get a good response on that. People were like, we're, ju we're just busy. Um, and of course, one of the responses was also the great resignation that everybody's going through. Yeah, you know, they've lost control. Exactly. They want to be able to manage what they have. Yep. Alder Lemon Tice. Um, two questions. Has Keith looked at this um, RFP and did he have thoughts? He did look at the RFP. Or the proposal, yeah. Right. Well, and, and their and their submission. He did no. We did not share their submissions with him. Um, but he, you know, he's the city treasurer, as I was indicating before, who helped us call others. Um, we can certainly share this with them um, and share his feedback with you. Um, but I think if the if the committee is open to a special meeting, time might be of the essence. To... Yeah, well, I, I just was curious. I don't think we need to ask him if you all are comfortable. And then, um, well, I guess my, my question is, are you having talked to them? I, mean, I know we got this. Have you talked to them separate from this? And are you comfortable that they can be uh, on top of our um, of our needs? Because we have, this yes. has been an issue for the city before yes, now. So is this um, going to help us solve that? Yeah. And we will be talking about that later on on the agenda. I know that Robin asked me to join a call, so I did have a chance to speak with Andrew. And I, I'm, you know, last time I told you I was hopeful. Um, maybe I'm even more hopeful this time around. Um, I, I certainly share the concern that there, this has to stop. Oh, Robin. Yes. Um, just to piggyback a little bit on what Bola said, I did leave out the point, uh, the part where we did do direct solicitations and um, in some of those phone calls where they didn't have questions, uh, the real true and honest answer was a lot of the firms want to handle what they already have. They were too busy. They were already booked and committed. And another um, reason is not a lot of audit firms are interested in doing municipal um, governmental audits anymore. They're just not worth the uh, labor and the expenses that are involved. Well, I would say given you know their CV and their size and their existing clientele, they certainly it would seem to me that they're obviously this is harder <laughs> given our troubles and our tales of woe, you know, then, then, you know, people aren't, you know, firms aren't able to handle it. Um, they seem as though that they, they are the type that can. So I, in that regard, it seems like they hit on all cylinders. Even um, So, I mean, I'm inclined to let's go forward and hopefully now once and forever, we will, no longer be confronting the issues that we have had with our audit and getting it done. Um, are there other questions, comments? I'm not seeing any. Um, so I guess uh, since I'm not seeing any further questions, I, I, I'd entertain uh, a motion to recommend the Board of Aldermen to select CLA for financial auditing services. So moved. Right. Well, second. Right. 
All right, it was a first by Alderman Tice, second by Alderman Gould. Um, any discussion? I'm not seeing any hands raised, so roll call, please. Uh, Alderman Sims? Yes. Um, Alderman Gould? Yes. Alderman Shelton? Yes. Alderman Tice? Yes. Well, motion carries. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, on to old business on uh, item eight, uh, A, revisions to the Brentwood Municipal Code, chapter 135, purchasing. Hi, item. Um, I have a memo prepared, uh, goes back to 2019, April 11th, where the Ways and Means Committee recommended revising chapter 135 of the City of Brentwood Municipal Code. And the committee uh, recommended the following option for um, purchasing limits. Purchase amount, budgeted purchases for less than 2,499. Uh, gives the conditions where it may be obtained in the most expedient way possible. Um, this does not preclude obtaining quotes for purchases. Uh, so budgeted purchase purchases twenty five hundred to nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars require a minimum of three quotes um, and the ways to get those are by email, regular mail, telephone, or fax. And budgeted purchase, ex purchases exceeding 20,000 require a formal bid or request for a proposal to be solicited and approved by the Board of Aldermen. So the recommendation was never taken to the Board of Aldermen for approval. So what we're asking for in this memo uh, after reviewing the person codes from the city of Clayton, Kirkwood, Maplewood, and the city of Richmond Heights, uh, we learned that the city of Brentwood has the most restrictive purchasing policy. And so the intent, the intent of the recommendation was to build more efficiencies across all departments while keeping controls in place to satisfy the board of aldermen as well as the residents. Staff is recommending that the Ways and Means Committee reaffirm the recommendation from 2019 to revise the City of Brentwood Purchasing Code and forward the new purchasing limits to the Board of Aldermen for their approval. Do, do we know why this never made it up to the Board of Aldermen? Um, I think it was just workload. Um, and greater priorities. Because I, I, I had to jog, I mean, I, I remember this vaguely. Mm -hmm. I had to kind of jog my memory. Um, and I, my recollection was that the, the reason it was approved was, well, the understanding would be that we're just gonna have to come through the budget um, and look at these expenditures closely and that that's the time to hash out particular line items that might fall into these categories. And I, and I feel like we do that <laughs> at length I mean, several meetings. Um, so, I mean, so that that's, because I don't, the, the makeup of the Ways and Means Committee is, is different now. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure, you know, since, you know, I don't think, I think I'm the only one that was on that, on that committee. Right. Um, so I, th I think that that was the, um, the thought of why that was, um, why this was approved that, you know, it's not as if we were blindly green lighting, you know, expenditures under $2,500. It's that we would have an opportunity to evaluate in, in the budget process. Um, so that was as best as I could. That 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 was my memory of it. Anyway, um, Alderman Shelton. So the issue we just took up, notwithstanding, is it are we fairly in a good position that we normally get a minimum of three quotes? I I just read this as I know the the purpose is to have more efficiency and um, just kind of be a newer. Obviously, the the last issue is is in front of mind, but kind of the the majority of things that we do. Get proposals on we don't have an issue getting the three proposals 
No, we don't. Um, now, some items must be sole sourced, but that is, um, that's really across all cities. Uh, having been with the city of St. Louis for 12 years, that was not uncommon because there are some commodities, products, and services where there's only one provider that do, does, you know, that's able to do those things. But for the city of Brentwood, in most of everything that comes through, there's normally three quotes um, backed up with the CRA request if it's over $499. So we are following the purchasing uh, policy and the financial and the city's financial policies and procedures. And then Robin, when you said that our, you found these or in other research that um, these are more restrictive, it, that's more so to the, the threshold limits? Yes. Um, in some ways, the staff staff has been coming back asking the board to reapprove essentially some purchases that were part of the adopted budget. And that is not an efficient and effective use of time, especially given um, we're a smaller city and um, we kind of operate um, tightly, meaning we are not overstaffed. We have just enough people to handle the workload. So there's some um, duplication of effort there and you having to reapprove items that you've already approved as part of the adopted budget. Thank you. You're welcome. Alderman Matisse. Um, so like just during the meeting, I pulled up the memo that was written in the 2019 discussion. Um, and it looks like Richmond Heights and Clayton have some more authority, not Maplewood. Those were just, those were the only cities that this comparison from a few years back had. Um, And I guess now, like now that you brought it up with the budget, my question is, like, there might have been things in um, Eric or Dan's budget that I would have looked at differently, like some fancy lawn, like, you know, one of the lawnmowers or one of those things. But I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to come back. So we'll just let it go in the budget because it, we're going to get to approve it. So um, I don't know if, I mean, I'm not opposed to this, but I don't know if there's a we could go ahead and move forward, but there's a timing issue that the things that like it might go into place next year. I don't want to slow things down, but for the certain purchases, it doesn't go into effect until the next budget year because we, I mean, I didn't look at the budget that way. I, um, and I'm sure there were things that I'm like, oh yeah, well, we're going to get to look at this again. So I can, staff really wants it, but I can say no later. You know? <laughs> No. Well, you know, um, those examples that you just mentioned, um, we would get quotes for them anyway. So they would have to fill out a capital um, check request um, before they would go out and, you know, get the quotes. Um, and then, so that's the first step that authorizes them that, okay, we have the money. Um, there, the finance director and the city administrator approves those. Um, and then when they get the quotes, then they bring back the check request to pay it. Now that would be on a check request, but then that for you to review, but that would be after the fact. Um, so yeah, I guess you have to look at the budget closely. Um, but if there are items on there as part of you looking at the budget closely, I, I think it's an opportunity for you to question those items. Um, and for this year, I believe similar items to that have been removed from the budget for police and fire. The only department that can still fund it is, is parks. Um, but, you know, at any given time, as you look through the budget, if we haven't made those purchases yet, you, you have an opportunity to bring them up. But then well, we have been operating without this. Uh, you know, without these, this memo or approval adoption, I mean, it certainly seems like things. We are, have been. I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Alderwoman Tice's point. I mean, I'm not, I, I voted yes on this when it came up before, but I'm sympathetic to her point that when we vetted this budget, it was, we didn't, it was predic part of it. It was a reliance on the fact of like, well, I can eagle eye this down the road if I need to. 
and we're kind of uh, removing a little bit of that um, mm -hmm. after the fact. And so, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. <laughs> uh, but I overall, I mean, I, I, I think that this makes sense. Except I'm, I'm for this year's budget. You know, how do we address that? You know, we, we voted yes in part, not understanding that well, we, we have the ability to kind of take a closer look once the purchases come, actually come to a head. So what we've also done in in prior years, we haven't always done this. We we've been doing it just to make you all feel comfortable with the um, expenses that each department has put in the budget that you all have adopted. So at the sometime during the year before, you know, within the first quarter, we have each department go back and give an overview of their operating budgets to the respective um, committees so that they have another chance, people that aren't necessarily always means to question them in even greater detail if they choose. So for I, not everybody's on multiple committees, but we, I, we ha I haven't talked about this with um, Dan or Eric or Whitney, but we should be planning to bring that before Public Works Committee. So you have a chance to, to discuss that. And if you remember, we indicated that there would be discussion later on in the year regarding some of the capital improvements that were removed. So if this serves as a reminder that we need to bring this to Public Works, Public Safety um, in the month of February, March, we can we can certainly do that if that will give you comfort. So wait, are you saying that, you know, to use the example of the fancy lawn mower, that that would go before Public Works? Yeah, it would be part of Eric's overall departmental presentation that this is, these are my plans for this year. Um, from an operating standpoint, from a capital standpoint. We have done that in prior years and we, we would do that again this year. Okay, how much, how complicated would it be to, and I think that this is an issue that's going forward, you know, everybody take a close look at the budget because these are the parameters, you know, for, for 20, um, 20, you know, for, for the next time we go through that process. But is it possible, you know, knowing that maybe some, you know, we passed a budget without this in place, and some of us might have relied on that so that we could take a closer look to have people come forward and be like, all right, these are my, these are my expenditures that are under $2,500 that I want to do. Um, I think that would be really micromanaging. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, my 31 plus years or so, I've never seen anything quite like that, but, but I want to get you all comfortable with the expenses that staff is, you know, encumbering the city, but to, to start looking at everything that's over 2,500, um, Don't those appear on the, on the warrant list? They appear on the warrant list. They, those that are less appear on the checklist, but if we have to bring every item, so that's what we were trying to get around <laughs> having to do by, by coming up with this policy in 19. But if you're, if you're not comfortable um, quite yet doing it, then because there are new people on this committee, then, then that's a different discussion. Well, well, if I could look back at what was actually approved, I looked at the, I found the minutes and um, it said motion by Alderman Weggy to take recommendation one, I, you know, there must have been different recommendations to the Board of Aldermen, includes a certificate of participation as long as the audit system is continued and the procurement takes effect after the 2020 budget is approved. So that's sort of the way it was designed in 19 was to do it like for the next budget cycle. Um, so I, I think I would be supportive of it if we can bump it to bump it to next year. And I would certainly, I mean, we spend a long time at those budget meetings, but I would just have a different lens when I looked at the budget next fall, if I'm, you know, still on this committee. And uh, you know, I, I'm not opposed to it, but so if, if you would recognize, I don't know if other department directors would like to just share their perspective on it, but I see Eric, Eric. has Eric yes. has hand raised. Yeah. Okay, Eric. Good evening. Um, just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Yes. yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to kind of touch base. I know this is something I've been pushing for for a couple of years. I talked to Karen about it when it first started and 
and kind of prodded her and knew she was busy. So it got delayed. So it's one of the first things I asked Robin about. The, the, the biggest issue as far as my department is the $500 limit. It really kind of handcuffs, uh, not handcuffs the wrong word, but really delays the amount of time it takes for staff to be able to get things done. So example for this is, you know, we need uh, dirt, clay, all those type of materials that we went to Brentwood materials before they're no longer there, went to now go to Kirkwood materials. We know exactly that they have the best price. Yet, if we need more than $500, we have to then find quotes, put it on CRA, send it to Robin, Robin signs it, Bull approves it. I mean, that process takes weeks to be able to get it through for us to get back. If you look at um, what is being proposed, I mean, really, you know, for the for the aldermen, you guys never saw anything below five hundred dollars. It was really the warrant list at two thousand. You'll still get that. Um, I understand Alderwoman Tice's uh, concern about the bigger equipment, and sure, I think you know if we want to do it for this year, be able to bring anything over ten thousand dollars back to the to committees like we always did. Um, I think that would be appropriate. We're just trying to expedite um, efficiencies more than anything else. Eric, what is the cost of that equipment, that lawnmower equipment? Do you remember? Lawnmowers, I mean, it's typically usually under 10,000. Okay. So um, again, that's, that's one. If it's just anything that you think is a larger piece of equipment or anything that would in the past have been gone would be a capital of purchase. Again, I'm happy to bring that back to Public Works or to the uh, presentation that Paula spoke about to Public Works in the near future. Well, I mean, at this point, I'm willing to move it on to the board, and I, you know, hear from you know, I, that, that to me is the only I'm is you know is the issue is that we're you know people might have voted on this you know budget keeping in mind that they had the ability to revisit us, you know, without something like this in place. But I'm, you know, I'm not going to hold, I, I would vote to move it on and, and kind of hear from, a, you know, the board at large, um, you know, if there's a way to adequately address those, con the, the concern that that might create for this year. Um, I mean, are there, does the committee have any other questions or thoughts on that? No, no, I mean, I'm certainly sympathetic what Eric just said, and I'm comfortable with these uh, smaller dollar amounts and, and um, it, you know, if you know that something's less expensive to, to go with that, but um, I think as some of these larger things, even up to $20,000, there are probably things in that range that I would have certainly looked at the budget much differently if I knew that by us pr approving the budget, the budget this year, that um, it would have given the department heads authority to do that. I'm not saying that's shouldn't be done in the future. I just wouldn't would have looked at it with a different lens. Um, so that's the piece, the, those larger purchases are the piece that um, that I think I'm most concerned about this year. So in as far as, um, you know, I guess just move, moving this up to the board for further discussion approval. Um, um, Cause I, I don't know if off the top of my head, I have a solution for that, but I'm willing to kick it up to the board like, <laughs> or noodle on it. I mean, Cause I, I, I agree with you all on Tice. Um, so, um, I guess so I, unless there's further input, I guess I would with, you know, that, background, um, I'd entertain a um, recommendation to uh, approve these purchase it, this purchase policy um, and to, to move it on to uh, the Board of Aldermen for consideration and approval. Alderman Gould. Um, I, I guess uh, uh, I'll make that motion. Um... Somebody wants to second it and then we can discuss. I'll second it. All right. So there's a motion by Alderman Gould and a second by Alderman Shelton. Any discussion? Well, Alderman Gould, Alderman Tice. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I think given the fact that this 
this this is not going to be just something that just ends up on the consent agenda or anything like that, right? It's going to be something that they're going to have to have the full board to, to discuss all of the, the the issues and concerns that uh, Alderwoman Tice is bringing up. I, I think that's fair to have them have that at that level. Um, I think because this was approved to go to the board for discussion before, in my opinion, it just lets you get it to the board and then, um, you know, have that discussion there before trying to totally work it out here, you know. Yeah, that's fine. I was going to try to fix it now, but if we want to have a discussion again, we can. I mean, are there concerns about, you know, if there's thing adjustments that need to be made and then we make an, a motion and get an approval there? I mean, honestly, I'm fine with everything. I just am not fine until the next budget year with these large $20,000 purchases not coming back to us. But I would be fine with that. Um, you know, I would be fine with making these other changes about the, um, I mean, it's not in a grid, it's just in words, but the, you know, upping the, some things from 2000 to 2500, like that's totally, completely fine. And then um, about the formal bids, upping that, you know, upping the formal bid amounts. I'm completely comfortable with all of that stuff. It's just this larger items um, for this calendar year and I would be comfortable approving it for the next budget cycle. Um, How about we, we delay this a little bit and give you a chance to take a look at the budget and see what are your concerns exactly with some of the items that were approved in the budget? That would work. I'd have to pull out my binder again. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we delay if, if the committee's in agreement, um, bring this back to the next Ways and Means Committee. Um, yep. So at least we get the conversation going and um, at least moving moving forward because there, there are new people on, on the committee. So the thought has changed. That's that just- works for me. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm it's, fair, it's fair if we can bring in, uh, hey, the, here's a list of, of items that might be affected by this change from the, the already approved budget. Are these concerns? You know, I think I think that would be to know what we're actually, actually talking about here. We'll bring this back in uh, March. Sounds good. All right, Do you so want to withdraw your motion? My motion? Or table it. I don't know. What, whatever. I mean, this is committee level. I mean, yeah. So either withdraw or or remove my table the motion. Yeah. So I so I, I don't think do I have to do this. Is it tabled now? <laughs> I think we can move on. <laughs> um, it's like a religious person making right? your <laughs> However, however, whatever gets to the finish line. But I mean, I, I hear everything that's heard and I, you know, and we'll, so we'll take a look at the old budget and we'll plan that next we'll come back and, um, you know, look at some specific line items that are concerned and, and hopefully that, that'll that address concerns and we can, you know, get something in place. Um, Seems like Gary's right. still raising his hand. Did you accidentally leave that up or is it up? I can't. And then my apologies. It's not appearing when someone raises their hand unless I'm clicking. Oh, I, I raised my hand. I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eric's I, hand is no longer raised, so I guess. Okay. <laughs> but apparently, my hand is raised now too, and I don't know how to do that. So, um, all right. Uh, you always have your hand raised, though, right? Being the chair. <laughs> You're to talk. Um, all right. Next item: Eight uh, B update on discussions with Zorbio Financial Edge. Okay, that's my item two. Um, so we have some very lofty and um, what I would call um, important as they are goals for the first quarter. Uh, so in 2019, resolution 1159 was passed, authorizing an, and approving an agreement with Zorio for financial system software. So the city began using the new software in late 2019. However, there are other modules that are available that were to be part of the conversion to allow us to uh, fully automate and integrate 
uh, helping us to improve effectiveness uh, and efficiencies um, across all city departments. Um, one of the modules was to be the purchase order requisition module. And that one, that module will allow the city to automate the check request approval process. Uh, right now we're using paper that has to be signed by the department head uh, and myself before we can process a check. Um, so using this module will also allow the city to fully uh, integrate the software and help us reduce errors, duplication, and improve effic efficiencies across all departments. So first quarter goals that we're working towards accomplishing related to the financial edge software with Zobrio, which is our software vendor, and um, they're in attendance. Um, we have five major implementations. The first one will be the ZAI budgeting module. And this module seamlessly integrates with the Financial Edge software system. Um, and there are other components that are included with that, which are the not only the budgeting mod module, there are reporting and dashboards, personnel budgeting, uh, Excel designer, and a budget book publisher, where we can publish our budget in-house. Um, the purchase of this module has various benefits for the city. You're gonna hear me say automation, automation. I sound like I am a commercial advertising for Financial Edge and Zobrio, but this is important for us to um, keep moving in the right direction in our finance department and across all cities. So this will, um, the budget module will allow us to automate the budgetary process with the capability for collaborating across all departments. We have an implement, implementation start date if this moves on to the board of February 8th with the completion date of June 30th, which will place us in a great position to be fully functional to complete the 2023 budget using this module. The cost is $32,310 for year one and 15,510 for two subsequent years, uh, 20, I'm sorry, for two subsequent years each. Uh, funding has been identified and will require a 2022 budget amendment. Um, so funding was found in salaries part-time, $24,205. Uh, we will not be able, that was for a finance, a part-time finance clerk. We will not be able to fill that position this budget year. Um, everybody's having trouble recruiting and retaining staff right now. Um, and to get somebody to come in to work for us part-time, I imagine we would have to have more funding for that because it's a competitive market right now, especially to get the skill set that we need. So we would want to take that, those dollars, and use them towards the purchase of this budget module along with uh, an additional 1500 in educational benefits that were set aside for me to continue my master's program. Um, right now we are in a, a, we are heavily transitioning in finance and um, I would rather use my time to keep us moving forward and delay going back to school at this point. Um, and then Parks and Recreation um, has committed from the Stormwater for, uh, Fund uh, the remaining $6,605 to help us fund this purchase. Are there any questions or comments or concerns? So just to recap, the, we've got money in the budget for this, is the short statement. Yes, yes. And we would really like to um, get out of the Excel spreadsheets that we're using because this will allow us to not have to present various different um, budgets to you all before we get to a final one. And are you satisfied that this, this is the software that will 
that will meet meet our needs get in and set you up to be able to you know get the job done because i don't i <laughs> i can hardly do a <laughs> word or zoom okay. So. <laughs> okay so um the honest transparent answer is this i've been with the city for seven months um and when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. It was the software of choice that the city had before I came on board. I have learned a lot about it. I've learned to live with it. I've learned to understand it. I have great relationships with all of Zobrio's team members. They're very supportive um, and they're on a different coast in the country and they make themselves available to me. I've worked with them for as late as 10 o'clock at night, there's a, a, a West Coast young lady who helps me and she is dynamic. Um, so, you know, relationship, relationship, and then you learn the software and you develop those relationships and you find ways to get yourself out of stuff that you may not have understood before. So it is the software that is in place. And I believe that we need to move forward uh, and continue to explore the possibilities uh, to fully integrate and automate and make things easier for the city of Brentwood. Alderman Gould. So we're adding you know, automation components and other dashboards that help make um, reporting more efficient. And, and in, in theory, if that's the case, does that cover some of the costs that it would have had for a, an assistant that you were, you're deferring? I mean, Yes, because um, there, there, are, um, there are other uh, modules that I'm going to present because I mentioned five implementations. And by the time I get to the end, yes, because it will greatly reduce some of the uh, duplicative efforts that the finance department and other departments are experiencing right now. So the, the long and short answer to your question, Alderman, is yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense if, if some automation tools, uh, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's worth it if, if it cause, creates efficiencies that are repeatable. Um, oh, sorry, I'll just want to dice. I just want to confirm um, that the, um, you know, this is really expensive. And does that include the time that you spend with the staff or do we pay additionally for that? I know different software companies um, handle that differently. Um, the proposal includes the training, the implementation and um, the annual subscription price project implementation, configuration, project management, reporting, and assistance with the budget book and training. So yes. Okay, so like if they, you have a question, it, you know, when you were talking to the dynamic woman at 10 o'clock at night, they're not, billing, uh, they're not billing Brentwood for the time. That, that's part of what we are paying for? Or do they charge us for questions that you're asking uh, beyond the actual initial training? Um, I read in the proposal that we have 10 hours of training. You're asking like for a uh, software support or, um, they have 24 hour, um, it's like an information line. And I believe that it, um, Robin, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Matt from Zobrio has his hand raised. He might be able to. Okay, good. Yeah. Cause I was just getting ready to chime in and, and say they're on the line. Uh, thank you, Robin. I just wanted to chime in here. Yes, we have included support as part of, uh, as part of this agreement. Um, Brentwood has a support agreement with us and that would all follow, fall under that agreement. And that's our current support agreement, correct, Matthew? Correct, yes. We okay. included so, these new modules under the existing agreement. Got it. So just okay. not to put a fine point on it, 
Robin calls you at 10 p.m. You help her, it takes hours to do. We're not getting an additional bill other than this, correct? As long as it falls under our traditional support um, and doesn't fall under something like new employee training or a, a specific list of items that Zobrio has and that, um, then yes, it would fall under our support agreement. And anytime there was a deviation from that, we would approach Brentwood and say, hey, this is, this is separate from support. We would produce a separate proposal that you would need to sign off on. Alderman Gold. Yeah, so can you explain the, um, the year one, uh, the profession services that, that's, you know, uh, six, 16,800, is that for training and implement, implementation year one? And then the assumption is that there is no need for that continue um, in year two and three? And is that why that's not part of the ongoing cost? Yes, uh, that, that's exactly true. We would plan on implementing the solution, take it through a design phase, um, have the solution up and running, and then we would turn the solution over to support uh, for years two and three moving forward. Okay. So for years two and three, we're looking at 15,510, that's on page nine of 13 of the proposal. Okay, so I'm not seeing, are there other questions? Are there for Robin or the vendor? Not seeing any, Bola, do you need a recommend a, a motion? Um, uh, okay, so I guess at this time, um, I uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve the uh, financial software uh, agreement with Zorbio as described in the, um, Attach the memo. So moved. Second. All right, there was a motion by Alderman Tice and a second by Alderman Shelton. Um, any discussion? All right, not seeing any. Roll call, please. Alderman Sims? Yes. Uh, Alderman Gould? Yes. Alderman Shelton? Yes. Alderman Tice? Yes. And motion carries 4 to 0. Uh, great. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, we're moving on to item nine. Are there any, uh, is there anyone in the virtual gallery that has their hand up that like to make a comment? Um, okay. See any hands? No. Not seeing any. All right. Um, at this point, we've got an item for a uh, closed session. Um, I would entertain a motion to go into closed session for uh, on pursuant to um, section 610.021 uh, uh, subsection one legal um, and to adjourn from there. So moved. Second. All right. Um, does that need to be a roll call? Okay. Uh, any discussion? Not seeing any. All right. Roll call, please. Alderman Sims? Yes. Alderman Gould? Yes. Alderman Shelton? Yes. Alderman Dice? Yes. Okay, motion carries to move to closed session. All right, we'll see y'all in a minute. Okay. <laughs>